All right. Ooh. How are we doing today? Good. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Well, we got a little rain last night. At least some people did. That's good. So, praise God. Oh, it's just good. I've been really looking forward to today. And uh, I hope you have been too. See, all, now all the smiling faces, where'd they go? <laughs> so, uh, we start uh, parking for the fair this week, Thursday. So, uh, if you have donations you want to bring for like corn dogs or something like that for the workers parking, feel free to do that. And you can do that anytime in these next couple of weeks. Um, or treats or gummies or, you know, any kind of things that, that are good to keep our energy up out in the heat uh, while we're working all day and night. So uh, feel free to do that. Also, we've got uh, prayer tonight and uh, worship, actually worship and prayer, and we've really been having a good time at that, lifting up the, uh, every one of us. We pray and lift up each one of us, and it's a really good time. So Wednesday night, uh, we'll have uh, worship and Bible study, and uh, we're training uh, Mikey here to be our uh, head usher. And so he's waving at everybody as they come in. That's awesome. Way to go, man. So praise God for that. So Wednesday night, uh, um, you know, a lot of times, uh, Bible study times, these are really the times that we can get deep into things and get into things that we don't normally get into. So feel free to come to that. Um, also, um, if you want to work for the fair, state fair parking, uh, get a hold of Sherry. Uh, she has a schedule, and uh, we can take hours, one hour, two hours, five hours, 12 hours, you know, whatever works for you. Um, also, the end of September, or beginning of September, the second week of September, our kids ministry is starting up again, and so that's looking real promising. We've got good volunteers uh, happening, and it looks like uh, we'll have, uh, for any adult volunteers, we're looking at only one Sunday a month, and uh, then for the youth volunteers as well, we just want to keep people in service and keep our kids taken care of, so that'll be good for that, I want to say something else um, on our missions board, which is as you come in the main doors, they're out in the out in the lobby, uh, or as you leave the sanctuary, it'd be to the right. Our missions board has uh, pictures and uh, communication that comes from our missionaries. Um, we give to missions every every month. Um, many of you give uh, regularly to missions as well, and. Uh, so that communication is out there. We also contribute to, and we consider it part of our missions work, uh, to a newsletter called Blessed and Beyond. Blessed and Beyond is published by a young lady. Her name is uh, Sharish Young. And uh, I know her. I know, actually, I know her dad. Her dad is a pastor um, over at Reconcilers Worship Center here in Des Moines. And uh, she has uh, just had a real burden for the prisoners and what started as 40 um, little newsletters a month is now up to 200 that are mailed to prisons um, all over especially the state of Iowa some outside we have three prisoners that that are affiliated with our church and so they are all getting that newsletter and I tell you what if an if they miss a newsletter if it doesn't come on time I hear about it. I get an I get an email from the prison saying, "Hey, I haven't got my newsletter yet," and uh, it's well done. And uh, so there's a letter from Sharice on the back bulletin board. Feel free to go read it. So, let's invite the Lord to be with us this morning as we get started. Father, we thank you, Lord. How much we need you. How much, Father to just come and sit or to come and speak. God, we need you to direct our steps. We need you to open our eyes, to open our ears to hear, open our understanding. 
Lord, that when we leave this place today, Lord, we will have seen things we've never seen before and that we will have heard things we've never heard before. And Father, we will know you like we've never known you before. And Father, you are the one that can make that possible. You are the one that can open the eyes of the blind, open the ears of those that cannot hear. And Father, as we worship you, as we lift up the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, as we invite your presence to be in this place, we ask, O oh God, that you would just fill this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to worship. So we're going to start with uh, an old hymn that we haven't done in a while. But you know, everything we are, everything we do, we're all here together at this place because of one thing, because of the blood of Jesus, because of his sacrifice. We all come from different backgrounds. We all come from uh, different circumstances. And the thing that draws us together in unity with us and the churches around us, you know, the pastors that I pray with on a weekly basis from, from uh, Des Moines is the blood of Jesus. We may have different names on the outside. We may have different leadership. We may have different types of church government. We may even have some things that we don't all agree on everything, but the thing that binds us together is the blood of Jesus. That's all there is. That's all there is. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me i 
Lord Jesus. Holy Lord.
when the mountains seem so high for our eyes to turn to you and remember that you are the one who moves the mountains that Lord the impossible is possible in you help us to remember Oh, Lord, move the immovable, break the unbreakable. God, we believe, God, we believe for it from the impossible. See a miracle, God, we believe. Praise God. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Yep. Amen. Praise his name. Mm. You know, that song should just bring a smile to every face, right? Right, right. It lightens the load, doesn't it? You know, Jesus says, take my yoke upon me. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. 
You know, it's not that, you know, it's really funny that, that when we bear the yoke with Jesus, the load is still the same. Do you understand that? The load is the same. The power to pull it has changed. The power to pull it has changed. He will let us carry it ourselves if we want to. He'll let us. So that kind of takes us where we're going today. So again, we're going to do a little bit of our uh, review today and look at why we exist. And Community Chapel exists to preach the good news about Jesus and to teach those that choose to follow Him how to be like Him. That's what we're learning. We sing a song like this about belief for it, and we're learning how to trust. We're learning how to trust. So, the disciple is learning a new way to live. And so, by definition, you can't be a disciple with, without your life changing. It's going to happen. When you go home this week, you're learning to trust. And when we come back next week, hopefully this week, we're learning how to trust better than we learned last week. It's just that process. It isn't that God is trying to so manipulate our lives that we can't do anything we want. He is trying to show us that His way takes us on a smoother path. So Paul says this. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Let's just stop right there for a second. Because, as we're going to see later what Jesus says today, He says, we can't, if we follow the customs and the patterns of this world, we will not experience what God has for us. It won't happen. And so Paul says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's what we're doing. You can call it brainwashing if you want to, but I want to wash my brain of the things that I pick up in our culture. I want to change the way I think. And then he says, then, that's how, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so we find that in this process that Jesus, Jesus' teachings go contrary to our logic. And it's because my thoughts are not like your thoughts, says the Lord. That's what we get. His thoughts aren't like our thoughts. His ways aren't our ways. They're far beyond anything you could imagine, he says. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I mean, when we get that, when we grasp that, then we wake up in the morning and go, okay, God, you see what I can't see. I think I know what the day holds, but we all know how many of your days always go just like you think it did in the morning? Nobody. So, so when are we going to learn? You know, the Scripture says that I plan my ways, but the Lord directs my steps. And basically what he's saying is, is that I think I know how it's going to go. I really don't. And God's going to lead me through those things. That doesn't mean that I don't have a calendar. My calendar's full. It doesn't mean that I don't plan my day. I do. But I let God direct it and weave it. And many times I come away from that at the end of the day having done almost nothing what I intended to do. But I look back and I see, wow, God, you have been in the very center of every moment. And so it's okay. This is such an important idea to God. In Jesus' teachings, He really tells us, you need to do whatever it takes to get this inside you. 
Whatever it takes that keeps you. I mean, Jesus talks specifically about sinning, but really sinning is, is just going o- away from God's way. I think it's James that tells us that he that knows to do right and doesn't do it, that's sin. Okay, so it doesn't mean if we're talking about murdering our next door neighbor or eating too many hot dogs, it doesn't matter. He that knows to do right and doesn't do it, to him is sin. And Jesus says, whatever it takes for you to walk in my ways, you need to do it. I mean, he gets a little drastic. He talks about uh, cutting off your, your hand. It says, uh, he talks about poking your eye out. And the idea is not that those are literal things that we do, but he's saying, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. So we talked about this idea. Jesus throws this thing in there about justice and the second mile, about how we're always looking forward to getting revenge for ourselves, making sure that everybody that, that we're always justified, that the things that we do um, that uh, always gets fixed. And Jesus says, he says this, he says, dear, oh, I'll, I'll say that too, that God is responsible for our justice. And, he, and Jesus says this, he says, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay back, says the Lord. And so what happens then is Jesus in his teachings, and this is another one of those things that goes contrary to our logic. Jesus says this, he says, the second mile turns our obligation and our oppression into ministry. So he says, if someone makes you do something, go ahead and do that, but then go the extra mile and begin ministering to them. The context is the Roman soldiers that were um, legally, uh, legally allowed to um, come up to you and carry their burden for a mile. And Jesus' listeners knew exactly what he was talking about. Because they, were, they may have been grumbling about, oh, that filthy Roman soldier made me carry his pack today. Isn't it just like Jesus to take that and say, you know what, if that happens, take that pack two miles. And take that obligation that you had to do, take that oppression that you felt inside, and turn it into ministry and offer it back and say, you know what, hey, you know, soldier, I know you've had a hot and sweaty day. Let me take that for you one more mile. Well, the limit is the ministry. The limit is where God instructs you to go. It's the concept, it's the idea that, that we, aren't, we aren't looking out for ourselves, but we are trying to give out what God has, opportunities that God has given us. And so, uh, we'll see that here in just a second. So he says this then, he says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on the one cheek, offer the other cheek also. And so here's what the Lord is teaching us. The Lord is teaching us to not take what we could take. Okay? To not demand what we could demand, but to freely give of what we could take. Listen to that. To freely give of what we could take and freely give of what we could demand to serve others. That just takes the whole self out of the picture. Jesus says, I've given freely to you. I want you to freely give to others. That's what he wants. Remember, that's what a disciple is. A disciple is learning to be like Jesus. And Jesus says, I freely give. I expect you as my follower to learn to freely give. 
That's what he wants. It's discipleship. And sometimes I get tired of that because I get tired of not always being that. I get tired of failing. Sometimes I've wondered, wow, God, how much patience do you have with me? So we talked about our merciful Father. We really kind of took a break out of this for just a little while. And this is where we landed on Psalm 103. This is what David is saying. He says, God is merciful and tender toward those who don't deserve it. He is slow to get angry and full of kindness and love. He never bears a grudge nor remains angry forever. You know, he, goes, he takes it just one step further and he says this, He has not punished us as we deserve for all our sins. For His mercy toward those who fear and honor Him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. Remember, at the beginning we were talking about His ways are higher than our ways. And His thoughts, and not just His thinking, His mercy, His grace, His love is far greater than we can even grasp. And David wrote this in Psalms a thousand years before Jesus was even born. He says, For His mercy toward those who fear and honor Him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far away from us as the east is from the west. Wow, that's, that's amazing. It's amazing the depth and the height of the love of God. And so in the middle of all this, the Lord says, you know, just as I have freely given, I want you to freely give, right? Right? But he says, I want you to do it in secret. I don't want everybody to see all the things you do. I don't want you to give a million dollars and put your name on the building that you just donated to. I don't want you to do that. He says, because if you do that, you've gotten all the reward. You've you've gotten all the reward you're going to get. Now, I have reward for you. If you do this in secret, I have a plan that's going to blow your mind. But I want you to do it in secret. And so what we see is he wants us to help the needy. He wants us to pray and fast, but he wants us to do it in secret. You know, our Heavenly Father sees what happens in secret. That's why he wants us to pray in secret. He wants us to do these things in secret. God wants us to help the needy pray and fast and will reward us if we do it in secret. That's what He wants. See, God wants to be the one who takes vengeance for us. He wants to be the one who provides for us. He wants to be the one who rewards us. And in order for that to happen, He wants us to rest and to trust in Him. That we can do all these things privately and in secret, and He will be the one that will reward us. Last week we went over a lesson that we've learned before. One thing. We have to get this. We have to get this. We have to get what Jesus was talking about where He says whatever it takes. We have to get this, that He is the most important thing in our lives. Knowing Him is the most important thing in our lives because nothing works outside of our relationship with God. He has to be the center of the wheel. He can't just be a spoke in the wheel of our lives. He has to be the center that everything revolves around. Or the the wheel is wonky. 
It goes down the road like this. God has to be the center. God has to be the center. This is what Jesus said to Martha, remember? He says, but the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. See, Martha hadn't discovered it yet. Do you see that? She loved Jesus. She loved Jesus, but she hadn't yet discovered that he had to be the very center that everything bowed down to. Her heart hadn't yet been at the place that her longing for Jesus was greater than her desire to serve a good meal. She hadn't understood that her desire for Jesus and her intake of Jesus, listen to that, the intake of Jesus had to be greater than even her desire to serve Him. Because when He's at the center, that purifies our motives. It purifies our actions. It organizes our priorities when Jesus is at the center. Man, it's so hard to get that through our heads. I'm just going to flip through a couple of verses here. That Jesus is talking about one love, one thing. He says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And if you weren't really sure what he meant, he really means even more than family or personal goals. He says this in Matthew chapter 10. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now we know that God loves us more than we do. We know that God loves our children more than we do. That God loves our family more than we do. And he says, in order for it to work, you have to love me first. And it comes to that trust. He says, more than money. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You know, Jesus repeatedly tells us that, that whatever we can to muster this concept in our minds, we must do it. Whatever it takes. Because it will change the way we live. And Jesus goes right into our message for today. And that is worry warts. Anybody know what a worry wart is? I mean, it's actually a term, but it's actually a term, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's actually a person who worries about everything. Well, my grandma, she had a different take on worry warts, and I don't think that she actually started the concept of worry warts, but my grandma, I mean, she was good at a lot of things. I don't know if you read my post last night in Facebook, but um, my grandma had a lot of good quality. She was a great guitar player my grandma she gave me my first guitar when I was uh, probably seven eight nine something like that and I would watch her she would play in church and she would play and I would sit next to her right here on the front pew and and I would sit there and watch her and that's how I learned to start playing the guitar because she was great she was great she was a good cook I didn't like everything she made, made, but she was a good cook. She was also a good knitter. Anybody a good knitter? She was a good knitter. She knitted all the time and crocheted anything with yarn. And she made these 
worry warts. And so she had them all over her house. And they were knitted worry warts. I'll show you a picture one in just a minute. But it, it's ironic that she made these worry warts. Because, so here's the idea. I'll show you this. So these are kind of worry warts. And hers weren't quite that pretty because I don't think they had those colors when, when you know, I was a little boy. But, but so she made these little worry warts. And so the idea was, I think her, hers actually had feet. Little uh, felt feet on the bottom. But anyway, so her worry words, this is the concept that if you worry, you take your worries and you give it to a worry wart. Okay? And so you're not supposed to worry. Well, the irony is, is that Grandma was a great worrier. Even though she made these worry words. And so in principle, these little fluffs of yarn were supposed to be the destination for our worries. And that's where they go, and we don't carry them. It lightens the burden, right? If the worry wart can do anything about your worries, which they can't. So what good is it? So we're, so we're going to read what Jesus has to say. So remember, Jesus is still talking to his followers, right? Right? And this is what he says. He says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food? And your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment? to your life and why worry about your clothing look at the lilies of the field and how they grow they don't work or make their clothing yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are and if God so cares for so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow he will certainly care for you why do you have so little faith So don't worry about these things. Saying what will eat, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So Jesus is really saying this. Why worry? Why worry? He says this. He says, we are more valuable to God than the animals, and He cares for them. So why worry? Jesus says if He clothes the flowers... Of course, He will care for us. Jesus is saying, duh. Right? Duh. He says, another proof, He says, our Father knows what we need. And so He says, spend your time on worthwhile things like knowing God. You know, Proverbs 12.25 says this. He says, it says, worry weighs a person down. Amen. Worry weighs a person down. Jesus is saying, hey, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So do things my way and you won't be Way down. Does that mean that there are never times that we don't know where the answer is coming from? No. The difference is, is that we have a, an understanding of who our God is. And we know that our God loves us 
more than anything. And that our God has the resources to provide all we have need of. And that our God is able and willing, so Jesus says, duh, why do you worry? I don't think my children ever wondered what we were going to eat at our house. It doesn't mean that Diana and I didn't ever wonder what we were going to eat at our house. But our kids never wondered. Because by the time dinner came, there was always something to eat. And so they didn't wake up in the morning. Oh, what are we going to eat today? I wonder what we're going to eat for lunch. What am I going to wear? Well, that happens. Mostly my daughters. What are we going to wear? But not because there weren't clothes to wear. You see what I'm saying? Jesus is saying, hey, in fact, let me just, let me just put it this way. Jesus is not saying... Why do you worry? He's really saying, how can you worry? That's what he's saying. He's saying, with a heavenly Father like we have, how can you worry? You obviously don't understand. He says, how can you have no faith? You obviously don't understand who your Heavenly Father is. How can you worry? Worry is a waste of time. Jesus is saying it doesn't make any sense that you would worry with such a loving Heavenly Father. Now, I will tell you this, if we're not following God, we have plenty to worry about. If the Lord isn't our Heavenly Father, if we aren't following Him, then we have plenty to worry about. Because life is unpredictable. Dale Carnegie said this, I don't know if he was a man of God or not, but he says, today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Jesus is saying this, if we worry, we don't know or understand our God well enough. Amen. But isn't it irresponsible not to worry? I don't think so. It would be irresponsible not to worry if God wasn't able to meet our needs. If God wasn't big enough to take us through the things that we need to go through, then it would be irresponsible. But God is big enough. And Jesus is saying, what in the world are you worrying about? Now, he's really saying this, knowing God will set our minds at ease. And we talked just about the song, We Believe. When we lay our burdens before Him, it lifts our load. The load is still there. But we're not the ones carrying it. Does that make sense? Jesus is helping to carry that load. You know, the Bible is full, front to back, of stories of people who trusted in God and stories of people who didn't in fact there's one story in I think it's second chronicles where the prophet comes to the king and says this to him he says the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the whole earth is looking for people he's looking all over the world to find people whose hearts are loyal to him so that he can show his power to them. 
I think it goes, uh, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole world to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. God is looking for that. If you're self-sufficient, then he's not going to find you. He's looking for people whose hearts are loyal to him to call out to his name. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. So how can you worry? How can you worry? You want to be free from worry? I do. We go to him. This is really what we need to say, right? Worry is a huge part of my life. I must know God better to free myself from this thing. Let's just bow together. And I'd just like us, you know, maybe we can't bow. Maybe, let's just look at the screen. What I want us to do is say that together. And in a prayerful way, you know, if that's really your heart, let's just say it together. Worry is a huge part of my life. I must know God better to free myself from this thing. And that's really where it's at. The Lord says, here it is. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll be the one responsible for your provision. Know me better. If you knew me as you say you know me, You wouldn't worry about this. Jesus says, how can you possibly worry with a God like we have? Let's sing together.
Your ways are higher than our own. We trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. We trust you. We trust you. Jesus, we trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. thank you for your word that helps to straighten out our thinking. Father, forgive us just for not realizing how great you are and how great your love is for us. Father, help us to see it better. As we go through this week and as worry knocks on our door, I pray, O God, that you help us remember how much you love us and how faithful you are to us and how able you are to do all that we have need of. For you are great, you are mighty, you are wonderful. And we love you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his blood. The way we come to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God good, yes? Have a great day, great week. I love you.